So I know you said HNMR, uh, and we will get to the HNMR, I, I promise, but first we gotta process all the information we've got. Um, so within this particular kind of random practice one, they aren't giving us a mass spec, but they are giving us a formula, which is where we end with that. Yeah, so we don't need to worry about that. I thought they were giving us a mass. So we don't even have to worry about doing calculation to get to that, we just have that formula. So that is gonna be an important piece to hold on to. The next thing we've got is our IR. What do we see within the IR? Fair point, okay. Um, we should scroll down a little bit so that we can see that baseline, because that can help out. I would argue you don't need that, but it is helpful. We've got CHSP3s, not particularly exciting. Seventeen forty-three seems a little bit high, but that's probably carbon double bonded to oxygen. After that, there isn't a whole lot else for us to go through and see and visualize. Um, and in looking at this, I want to go back to that formula real quickly. God damn it! Really, we're not doing this one because we've already done this one. Done that one. Like that keeps being the example. So C5H10O2, okay, so this is convenient, or a little bit better. It's at least a different for Okay, it's at least a different formula, processing through potential answers on what we're looking at within this, okay, and we've got the exact same thing with the IR. Okay, so we have CHSP3, and we have that carbon-oxygen double bond. Okay, the next part that we would kind of move to would be looking at our HNMR. Um, you're not gonna let me scroll down. What if I, uh, okay. uh, and one of the things that you particularly asked for was kind of dealing with that summary sheet on putting all those pieces together. It's kind of hard for me to force the summary sheet in here, but what I, I think I can manage um, is doing a fake one on top of this. So when we start HNMR, what's the first thing we need to evaluate? Okay, how do we know unique hydrogens? I see four. Three. Four what? Three signals. what? Signals, okay? So we're looking for our sets of signals, okay? How do we know we have four signals? And interestingly, you oscillated between three and four. Because they're kind of mixed together, but you have two, three H3, three H3. So this particular example helps us out with those markings to help us identify that those are four distinct signals. Okay? We could push further and look at the peak patterning behind those, remember our splitting patterns, and recognize that the set of peaks at whatever that is, about 1.25, is two different sets of peaks. Okay? That doesn't fit any of our standard peak patterning. So we've got four unique signals. So we've got four unique Everybody's been giving me such a hard time over my handwriting. I feel like i got to improve. No, it's good. It's good. Four unique hydrogens within this. Uh, no. Okay. okay. I think I can draw a straight line-ish. As long as I'm under this line, I should be okay. So we had four unique hydrogens, okay? So within the table that I asked you to go through and do is really just trying to slow your interpretation, particularly because if you watch someone do this, they're gonna do three quarters of the table in their head, right? Or if they're really good, they do the whole table in their head. And you say, oh, well, this is what the answer is, and it looks kind of daunting. This is why we wanna break it down. The first thing we want to look for is our chemical shifts. So what we're trying to do is remove some of this spectra peak stuff and just start to nuance exactly the details within it. 
right? So we've got four different signals, so we should be coming up with four different rows of data here, right? Our first signal, I'm gonna call that 1.1, and I'll try and color code them as we go. Make sure that stands out. Green one we'll call, right? One, two, three, four. We'll call, I'll call 1.3. Then we'll call it orange, whatever that is, 2.3. And I'll throw in blue for the last one at 4.1. What the next part is, is now an interpretation. What does it mean to have a signal at that point? Okay. The first interpretation means we've got hydrogens. Every single one of those has to have a hydrogen connected to it. Um, I'm going to color code here, and we might see why towards the end. Okay, this might help to see what you're referencing when you're talking about pieces. Mm -hmm. right, we have to have a hydrogen in all those cases. Right? Do we know what that hydrogen is connected to? Yes. If we're within that zero to two range, that was something that we're told to ballpark, at least ballpark memorize that it should be an alkane, which means our green and our red should be bonded to carbons. Whoops, come on, pen. Right, what about the orange? Okay. That one's a little on the borderline, okay? full disclosure, because that's right at that kind of two line, 2.3, 2.1. I leave that up to you, your discretion to kind of go through and decide your confidence in it, and that comes with experience. Okay? Minimal confidence, you don't know. Okay? That's fine. Hydrogen bonded to question mark. The next one at four is well within that everything else range. I would argue everybody should be calling that hydrogen bonded to question mark. Right. The next layer of information that we would bring into this would then be the integration. In tag, okay. Enough that it's not interpretation. Right. So again, I want to go to the graph and pull the information out. So my red signal had an integration of 3H, my green 3H, my orange 2H, my blue 2H. Okay, so we're just pulling that information straight off. I don't want to start doing an interpretation right away because, again, I'm just trying to simplify what I'm looking at. Kind of make sense? Yeah. So now what do we interpret? Say that again. Okay, that 1.1 chemical shift, or our red one, is probably a hydrogen bonded to a carbon, but there's now three hydrogens bonded to that same carbon. So what we're saying is it's a methyl group. I like to now show a hanging bond, saying that structure is now continuing off. I didn't do that initially because I would have to draw a ridiculous amount of hanging bonds, and that's too much effort for me. Okay, but here I can now drop that in. Is there another possible interpretation? Okay. I could have the interpretation where there's three different becomes a bad word because they aren't different. They have to be chemically identical, but three atoms of carbon in varying locations around the molecule and all of each of those atoms each have a single hydrogen connected to them. That requires lots of symmetry within the molecule. The odds that you have a molecule that are highly symmetric like that are pretty slim. Okay. That's a pretty high level process to go through, right? both for you as students and then both for somebody actually making a molecule that has that level of symmetry not manifesting everywhere else. Does that make sense? Okay. So between these two, which interpretation is better? Exactly as you suggested, it's probably a methyl, okay? a CH3. What does that mean for the next one? Same thing. And if you're thinking back to the document and being like, well, these tables, like, Mike, why aren't you putting this perfectly into the... 
there's only so much space within a given sheet of paper, okay? So the tables are kind of arbitrarily small boxes because I'm trying to satisfy kind of the majority of your cases, right? If it doesn't fit on that spec org document, that's okay. Pull out another sheet of paper and fill it up and do the table on a whole sheet of paper. That's fine, right? Provide yourself that space to be able to see it. We're limited here. Okay, so we're going to encounter an issue where it's going to be very challenging to see because I don't have a lot of space to be able to process all this. Okay? What's the next one? The orange one. Okay. It's two hydrogens. Again, the easiest interpretation is that there's two hydrogens connected to that exact same question mark. Okay? Since it's a question mark, I don't know how many hanging bonds there are, so I won't identify those. Okay. Last one with the blue, Whoop. same thing. Does anybody want to go through and say, but Mike, I think I know what the question mark is? But Mike, I think I know what the question mark is. Okay. Why? I'm just taking, I feel like, I mean, they're all, it's always between carbon, so I'm just going to say carbon. You can do better. Mm, you just don't have confidence. You can do better. Wasn't it in the formula? Say that again. The formula at the very beginning said, I already forgot what it was, C5H10O2, which means the hydrogen has to be bonded to either carbon or oxygen. Okay. Could it have been bonded to the oxygen? Yes. Ah. Oh. <laughs> No, it couldn't have been bonded to the oxygen. Why do we think it couldn't have been bonded to the oxygen? Why does Mike go, oh, that's a great conclusion. Why do you think that? What kind of bond would you have seen if you had an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen? OH bond. An OH bond. Where would we see the OH bond? In the, in the IR. Did we see it in the IR? No. no. So the hydrogen's not bonded to the oxygen. Therefore, it has to be bonded to the carbon. So you could call the butt mic and put those question marks, that sounds a little weird, okay. put those question marks as carbons. That is your call. Okay. At this stage, I'm not going to because I wrote a question mark and I want to erase it. Make sense? Okay. What you've now done is an interpretation of the integration. So now what we have to do is move to the next thing on the list, which is our... Our multiplic I'm just gonna leave it at that. Okay, the multiplicity. Okay, aka the number of peaks. Okay, so we would go through, we'll deal with that in a second. Okay, we go through to look at each of these individual signals and we say, what is the multipli multiplicity? How many peaks do I see for each of those signals? So where do you want to start? Red, lovely. How many peaks do I see for the red one? Three, okay, one, two, three. Why are those not counted? Because the next set are part of the next grouping of peaks. So I get three peaks for the red one. How many get, uh, do I get for the green one? Three, how many do I get for orange? And blue? Four, okay. So this is now kind of my sequencing so far for, forward. So far okay? Okay. The next part is technically an interpretation because we're now analyzing the data. Okay. This is our number of neighbors. Okay, so we're going to interpret our multiplicity to give us information about the neighboring hydrogens. Because when we're talking about HNMR, it's the nucleus of our hydrogen is a magnet. And if it's near other hydrogens, I'm bringing more magnets near each other. They have an effect. Okay. You can go into quantum or do more reading within NMR if you really want to to learn what the specifics of how and why that effect are. All we need to know is that it has an effect and what that effect means. Okay. What it means is that our number of peaks is going to be related to the number of neighbors. As you started to suggest, how are they related?
equals the number of neighbors. Okay, which is a great way to formulaically have memorized this as opposed to the way it's maybe presented in the textbook. I honestly don't remember, but it's definitely how I presented it. the other things, the other way around being positive. But this way sets it up that I can go from my multiplicity to my neighbors, right? Okay, so all I gotta do is subtract one. So my red three becomes two, my green three, orange four. Can't do math in my head, that was really bad. I almost wrote two. Okay, so we've got now our neighbors. Now what we move to is our, what I would argue, our full kind of interpretation, okay? I want to know what that means to my structure, okay? And this is where it's going to get really messy, okay? And I'm going to add another color here because when we're looking at that first line, that red line, that signal is due to the CH3. The splitting of that signal is due to the neighbors. Those neighbors are not in that signal. They're somewhere else. So I'm going to do a slight color shift here to show that difference. Okay? So I'm going to copy out my CH3. Okay? And I now know that that carbon must be bonded to something that has two hydrogens. Because of our splitting patterns, okay, or the vast majority of cases that you will ever see, because we have splitting, we know that that next atom must be carbon. Okay? Because if it was oxygen or nitrogen, it hides those neighbors, so we can't see them. Okay? I have to have two neighbors. So what do I need to do? Add two hydrogens. And I would still show my hanging bond. So that black signal is something that I can interpret from the red signal, but it is not part of the red signal. Does that make sense? No. Fuck. At least for me. I haven't done it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does it make sense for somebody else? Jeez. Yeah? Okay. Then, sorry. Damn. What happens when we move to the green one? What's the interpretation? I copy my past one. I have a CH3, but I now know that, that CH3 has two neighbors. Which means I'm going to have another carbon with another CH2. And again, I'll show that hanging bond. What happens with the next one? I don't disagree with you necessarily in saying that you have a carbon with three hydrogens, but you leaped a step. Where do we start? I start with a CH2. I would already say you're changing something because I, what I should be saying is I start with H2 question mark. Why are you now saying it must be a C? Using all of our other spectra, we said it was a C. Right now, we have another piece of information telling us it's a C. When you have splitting, what atoms are connected? Carbons. If it was an oxygen or a nitrogen, it hides those neighbors. Which means if you see any splitting pattern, if you've got question marks, by definition, they are now carbons. Because if there were any other atom, it would hide those and you wouldn't see a splitting pattern. So we now have a second piece of evidence that that is indeed uh, a carbon. So I would say that's a big interpretive section now that's happening just within HNMR. HNMR is now telling us that that's a carbon. That's kind of cool. Okay. Jess suggested that it is now next to a CH3. Okay. Is there another interpretation? Yes, thank you. What's that other interpretation? OK, 
right? So what we're showing for orange here is valid. Both of those are valid interpretations. How do we decide which one is better? There's two approaches to deciding which one is better. One is nice because it gets kind of immediate feedback for us, and the other one isn't quite as nice. It's not symmetry. We'll call this A and B. If A is true, I have this black CH3 floating around. If that structure is true, that means when I go back to my set of peaks, should I see a CH3? Yeah, otherwise A would be false. So I can go back to my data set and say, do I have evidence of CH3s? I do, okay? I'm not saying necessarily which one's which, I'm just saying I have evidence that they exist. Now let's take a look at answer choice B. And answer choice B, if we look at that option, if it's true, I have evidence of a CH2 and of a CH. Does that make sense? Do I have evidence of a CH2? Hmm, dang. So does that mean both of these are equally valid? No, why not? The other half of that was I needed evidence of a CH, and I don't have evidence of a CH. So that means interpretation B, while it's a valid way to interpret three neighbors, it doesn't fit the pieces or the data set that I have. Everything is internally congruent, and that doesn't match that congruency. Okay? I would argue that's the fast way of interpreting that B was wrong, and we can go through and erase it, right? which I'll ask about here in a second. The other way is you just guess, and you move on. Right? And you move to the part that you say you were having questions with. How do I put all these pieces together? And you try and put the pieces together, and what you will find is if you cho chose structure B, you would not be able to put the pieces together. Right? That's really painful. Because you're going all the way through to the very end to be like, I suck at this. Now is the question that I suck at it because I made a mistake or is it because I suck at it? That's a really hard question to answer. Right? So what you should be doing is enough practice that you hit these, oh, I don't know what it is, that you double back and you're used to that process so that you can move through it a little bit more fluidly. Make sense? Okay. That said, can I erase answer choice B? Thank you. Okay. So our orange one is now interpreted, so we can now move to our blue one. What does our blue one say? They're not wrong, so I can't really complain about that. Okay. But we should be layering that. Okay. I can add information. It's not a question mark anymore because I have splitting. The splitting pattern means the question mark must be a C. So I have to be looking at HC. Okay. The integration came to 3, which means it needs to be next to a CH3 or... a CH2 and a CH, which we just went through for orange, didn't make sense, so it's not gonna make any more sense for blue. We good? Yeah. Okay. So in this case, what I've now done is to me, that's interpreting the HNMR. Hooray, good job, you're done. You've interpreted the HNMR. Okay. What we would now try to do is resolve this information. How do we now take those pieces and summarize them all together to get to a final structure? Okay. This is where, depending on how you've interpreted your process or the path that you've gone through, and of the labs, I only did this for one lab, I think, um, you have to go back to your mass spec data. You have to go back to where you had a formula and use that formula to help you interpret. Some people had written it down or at least had it memorized. What was the formula? Uh, two times carbon. Nope. What was the formula for this compound? It's not C5H10O2. Sorry, I was getting something else. Okay. 
We're gonna play this a little bit weird. I selectively misheard you. I only saw C5, H10. What does that mean? How many carbons do I have up there? Five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've drawn eight carbons. What does that mean? There's duplicates. So now it's a question of going through and trying to weed out duplicates. Okay? And say, how could I combine these in a way that I can remove some duplication? Okay? So now what we can do is start to shift things down. Okay, I had that C, I'm gonna pick with, I almost always start with the red one, um, but I was looking at a slightly different piece. I have that red CH3, and I know that red CH3 was connected to a CH2. Okay, so I'm starting with that, that signal has now been used, I've summarized that. Okay, I know there's duplicates, so what I'm gonna go through and do is look for the CH2, okay? Because the CH2, I, I don't have a signal for yet. I know the red one was a signal. So I'm going to go through and look at my pieces and see, do I see information for a CH2? I do. What does that mean? Okay. So we've got CH2 showing up at three different places. Of those three different places, which one should I look at? Green, orange, or blue? make you feel a little bit better. It's not even a 33% answer right. It's 66% of your blind guessing could be correct. Do we look at our green CH2, our orange CH2, or our blue CH2? I would argue the green is the wrong one. Why is the green the wrong one? Is the CH2 in the signal for green actually the thing in green? No, that's the thing I have secondary information about. If we look at the CH2 in my red one, that's the thing I have secondary information about. That's, that's not actually weeding information out. So what I would do is look at the orange and the blue as potentials. Okay? And when I go through and look at those, both of those look the same to me, and we'll evaluate that in a second. Okay, so the orange and the blue, and we can go through and say, okay, that makes sense. I have a CH2 and orange next to a CH3. So could this be the orange CH2? Yeah, could also be the blue one. Which one do you want to make it? Ta-da, it's orange. That signal is now evaluated. Okay. Now, how many carbons do I have? Six. Why is it six? I've only really weeded away evaluating these two to get me down to two, so I dropped those four down to two. What have I done with the other ones? I haven't done anything with them yet, so they're still there. Okay. Could that CH3 be the same CH3? This black CH3 is next to a blue CH2. Is this a blue CH2? No, so could it be the same? No, okay, it has to be now a unique signal. So what we can now do is pull one of those other pieces down. We could pull down the green CH3. Okay, and we know it's bonded to a black CH2, right? So the green one is now used, okay? If I did that, that would be four, five, six, because I account, haven't accounted for the blue th thing yet, right? Right, I'm supposed to have five carbons, so we gotta look at this. What should I do? I have duplication, so I have to go through and now say, is this blue CH2 possibly that black CH2? What do I know about the blue CH2? What is it next to? The CH3, what is this black CH2 next to? CH3, which means? It's duplication. That's the wrong eraser. 
How are we feeling? Okay. Can we solve this? Um, and this is where you might be thinking of all the other stuff we talked about. What we're talking about is what's on the board right now. Can you solve this? Missing carbon. Yeah. If we go through and look at this, I've got four carbons. I'm supposed to have five. How many hydrogens do I have? Ten. So I've accounted for all the proper hydrogens. So if I'm missing the carbons, maybe I need to add another carbon in here and try and put that into this. Okay. To bridge the gap between those two pieces. Okay. So maybe I've got something along these lines. My CH3. This one's orange CH2. CH3. This should set up some problems. Why would this structure potentially set up some problems? Say it again. I haven't specified any hydrogen, so I don't accept that. I am leaving it open, so I would have to fill them with something. I can't fill them with hydrogens. Why not? I've used all my hydrogens. Right? We have to satisfy that octet somehow with something. What should we satisfy it with? I don't have an oxygen. Okay. This is where we could go back to our molecular weight and be like, oh, I'm missing something in my molecular weight. Okay. Or we looked at the IR, and what did the IR say we had? A carbon double bonded to an oxygen. When we went through to summarize these pieces and got these two nice colorful pieces, what else should we have pulled down? We should have also pulled down that I have a carbon-oxygen double bond. Why don't I see evidence for that in my HNMR? There's no hydrogens on it. You can't see evidence for it because there's no hydrogens on it. Hydrogen NMR only shows you hydrogens. Okay. So what could we do? Ah, let's hang those two pieces on. It would show up in the CNMR, and it would show up in the IR. Okay, so this is why you have to go back and reference those other pieces. This is also why you have to go back and reference those other pieces, because what's the problem with this structure? It's symmetrical, which means is the orange CH2 different from the blue CH2? No, which means I only see two signals, not four. So damn, I must be missing something else. What was the formula? C5H10 what? It wasn't just O, it was O2. Okay. So that when we go through and summarize all of these pieces, our HNMR gave us all of that, but we also know we have a carbon-oxygen double bond as a piece, and we also know we have an oxygen with two bonds. Why do we know the oxygen has to have two bonds? Degree of bond saturation? No. Charge. What do you mean charge? Elaborate. I like it. You would have a charge on it if it was anything else. If it was three bonds, it would be charged. If it was one bond, it would be charged. And we're looking at our structures. Everything that we're going to throw at you will be neutral, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay? You know that. Why? Because I've just seen that so much. You just know that because you've seen it so much. You mean like we spent five weeks at the beginning of the semester saying we need to memorize our common bonding patterns so that when we get to spectroscopy, we can answer the question, how many bonds should our oxygen have? Yes, that's why we did it. You've seen it, you've been exposed to that, you know that common bonding pattern. If you don't know that common bonding pattern yet, that's going to be problematic and challenging to figure out how to put pieces together. Okay? So now how do we connect these? Could I connect the blue carbon to the orange carbon? Why not? 
that would end the structure. I would close out the structure. So orange cannot go to blue, or however you want to gesture that. Okay? Could the blue go to the carbonyl? Could the blue go to the oxygen? Which is more correct? That's an interesting point. Let's push on that. Let's, let's, let's run with that. Okay. Um, you happy with those pieces? Do you think you know how they could possibly come together? Rough idea. Okay, rough idea. So let's look at the two possibilities that could come out of this. What was the other color? Green. Okay. Or, per my questioning, Grunts get recorded. <laughs> so, what's the difference between these? How do you know which one is correct? They're the same. Aren't they both correct? They're for the exact same thing. In this particular case, we could go through and say, particularly if you were colorblind, okay, and that's going to be an important aspect of this, that they are identical structures. If we we're going to go through and solve this with our pencils or pens, you're going to draw the exact same structure. There is really no difference between these. Okay. But for those people that are colorblind, I apologize. We're not colorblind. One of them is more correct than the other. Did you say the bottom one is more correct? Yeah. This one is more correct. Okay, I accept bottom one. Call that bottom B and T. I actually don't know. I didn't actually look to figure out if you're right or not. So why do you think the bottom one is more correct? Because on the top one, the oxygen is connected to the hydrogen. Whereas with the bottom one, the oxygen is connected to the Fair point. Let's push on that a little bit. If you're saying the oxygen is bonded to the hydrogen, a couple things pop up. What's the first issue? If we had a bond between oxygen and hydrogen, it would show up in the IR. It didn't show up in the IR. Okay. When you're referencing the octet, that's because what you're doing is now extrapolating out this structure further and saying that you're getting something like this, which, yes, would break the octet, which is why that's not what that shows. Okay. When we write out our formula this way, and this goes all the way back again to unit one, that's what's happening. There is no bond between oxygen and hydrogen. Okay. Again, I have not looked to see which one is correct. You could still be correct, but your explanation is wrong. As a hint, you referencing the oxygen was lovely. This CH2 is close to the oxygen. Because it is close to an electronegative element, what would happen to the orange chemical shift? It should shift to a higher number. If we look at the bottom drawing, our blue CH2 is close to the electronegative element, which means the blue sh CH2 should shift to the higher number. We would evaluate that by going back and looking at all the color coding that we went in, and we look at comparing blue and orange, which one had the larger chemical shift? Mm -hmm. The blue one, which means the blue CH2 was closer to the oxygen, which means 
the bottom one is indeed the correct one. Would you, if we did top one, and we wrote that down, we marks for that? Okay, so again, remember, there were some very special conditions that allowed us to ask this question, to even consider this. What were those special conditions? Colors. The only reason I could ask the question, which one is correct, top or bottom, is because we've color-coded this. Black and white, everything. I can't tell the difference. No one would be able to say which one was correct because structure T and B, our top and bottom, are identical. The only difference is the arbitrariness of the colors that we put onto it. Okay? Kind of, sort of? Okay. What it does point out is the issue that I addressed in a couple videos or a couple lectures ago, is that if we drop off that and make it a this scenario, that's a, no, that's right, okay? And we make it not two ethyl groups, now there's a distinction between those. The only way to differentiate between these two structures is, again, the chemical shift. These are now different structures because they don't both have ethyl groups. Kind of, sort of? Yeah. Does this help you understand this kind of piecing process? Yeah? yeah? Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is really just going to be practice. Should we try and do another one? Or do we want other questions? That looks like another question. Is that okay, or is it a different question? Uh, yeah, that's okay. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. Um, what do you all notice first with this question? Graphs. Yeah, we don't have any graphs. Do you need the graph to do any of the interpretation? Yeah. Nope. Okay. In fact, what this is doing is kind of minimizing that and making that less of an issue. This is like looking at just the SPECT.org documentation behind it. I would argue this makes it more difficult because you now don't get the benefit of just the pretty shapes and pictures to help kind of interpret, and so you have to layer in a little bit more detail. Okay. Where should we start? Okay, since so you didn't answer, what would you expect to see in the mass spec? Not the question that's being asked up here. I'm asking a different question. You didn't answer fast enough, so we made it more difficult. What would we expect to see if we looked at the mass spec? Like the weight? We'd expect to see the molecular weight. I accept that. What else would you expect to see? So you'd find the M plus. Ah. Okay. Not only do we have the M+, plus, we know the M+, plus should be odd because you saw nitrogen in the formula. Good. We're reversing the logic on this. And uh, M plus 3. Or M plus 2 with 1, 3 there you go. height, whatever. Okay. You're getting an M plus 2 with a 3 to 1 height. The 3 to 1 height is what tells us that we have that chlorine. Okay. Um, I want to point this out. I have no good notation for the M plus 2. As far as I know, this is the notation used by everybody. It's a horrendously false notation because it makes it look like we're looking at a positively two charged atom. That's not what we're looking at, right? What we're looking at is the M plus plus 2 units. Okay? So if the M plus was 118, the M plus 2 is 120. Okay, I just want to call attention to that just in case somebody else watches the video and then gives me a hard time for it. Not that I really read the comments on YouTube, but whatever. 
Okay. So does that all make sense? Yeah. Cool. Now where do you start? IR. Okay. We should be faster with that. Okay. We want to start with the IR. What do we see within the IR? Thirty four hundred, you're calling that NH. Why are you not calling that OH? Because there's no RCP. Perfectly fair and acceptable. If I saw a thirty four hundred broad, my first response was OH. The formula says I don't have oxygen, so it can't be an OH, it needs to be an NH. Very good. What else do you see? I'm hearing lots of things. What do you guys see? I heard someone say CL, which is useful. You're shouting out a bond. Where does the CL bond show up in IR? Yeah, there you go. Oof. Mm. Not us. We're not going to look for the carbon chlorine. You could make the argument that it is visible. Um, I believe that's the 820 is actually the carbon chlorine. If you're comfortable having memorized that and dealing with that, then go for it. I'm not comfortable with it. I actually wrote it, but I'm not comfortable with it. Okay. You mentioned a CH. Shouldn't you see CHs? Yeah, I didn't pay attention. I was just kind of guessing until I saw the IR. Okay, and what do you see in the IR data that makes you say you think we've got CHs? I don't. Looking at, looking, I just saw 15 is more of a carbon carbon. Okay, so yeah, the 1590 is maybe about 1600. Do we know anything that shows up at 1600? Carbon carbon double bond. Okay, carbon carbon double bond from an aromatic. Okay. So that could be suggesting looking not at a carbon-carbon double bond necessarily, but the benzene. This gets a bit misleading because the aromatic usually has a bunch of other peaks with it. We're not looking at a spectra, so that's hard to say. So it could be carbon-carbon double bond. It could be an aromatic. I would put a very heavy question mark because I don't get to see it to be able to make that interpretation. Right? Based off of my confidence, I don't like 1590, I don't like 820. Both of those look like distractor answers to me, and I'm not going to evaluate them. 3400, I do want to touch. 3250, I should touch too. 3250 is greater than 3000, so I might immediately say, well, that's CHSP2. But the CHSP2 should be just slightly larger than 3000, not 32. That seems a little bit weird. Okay? It being up at 32, someone actually said it, it could be another NH. Okay? The NH has the potential to give you two peaks. Okay? So that's a possible interpretation. With me, am I confident? No. Really, the only thing I'm confident about was the very first thing, 3400 NH. Okay? The rest for me are shots in the dark. I, I would put big question marks next to them and not rely on them. I would hope that the rest of my spectroscopy data would give me some information that would allow me to interpret that more appropriately. Kind of, sort of? So with the aromatic ring, if we look to that carbon-carbon double bond, uh, I think you're saying something else. Say it again. Like, if we didn't have the carbon-carbon So what you referenced was the last piece that we would get from mass spec, which I always forget, so good on you. From a molecular formula, what else can we pull? Do you remember what it's called? You're describing it lovely. Degrees of unsaturation. How many rings or double bonds are in our compound? Because we now know the relationship between our carbons and hydrogens. This one allows us to take ripping advantage of that formula if we bother to memorize it because it gives us both halogens and nitrogens. Two times the number of carbons. Two times six plus two. You all need to help me out. Plus nitrogens. It was plus nitrogens? Yeah. Okay. Plus nitrogen, there's one. Minus halogens. Minus halogens, one. 
minus hydrogens, six, and then all of it divided by two, I know. Uh, two times six is 12, plus two, 14, 15, 14, eight, four. I know that was a bit sketchy. I did that all kind of, we following that? Did I do that right? You don't think I did it right? Okay. 12 times 6 gets me, or sorry. It gets you 12. It gets me, fine. It gets me 12, plus 2 is 14, plus 1 is 15, minus 1 gets me back to 14, minus 6 gets me to 8, 8 divided by 2 is 4. Okay, so that's 4 degrees of unsaturation, okay? 4 degrees of unsaturation means I could have 4 pi bonds. Okay? I could have one triple bond and two double bonds. I could have four rings. I could have a whole multitude of things. But when we talked about that 1590 at 1600, one of the suggestions was what if it was an aromatic? How many degrees of unsaturation do you see in an aromatic? There's the ring and then three pi bonds, which means four degrees of unsaturation. Okay. That could add a layer of like, okay, fine. They didn't give me a lot of context, but internally an aromatic ring back to the formula could make sense. Does that make sense? Good job pointing that out. Okay. We've now used two stacks of data to try and piece through some of this. We've got a little bit of internal consistency within that. Okay. I don't see anything else within the IR. I would move into the HNMR. One of the first things, particularly after you pointed out this mass spec thing, that I would be looking for in the HNMR would be what? Aromatic. Not clear enough. What was that? Aromatic. I'd look for the aromatic. Because in my chemical shift for my HNMR, there's really only four major categories, I think four major categories, and aromatic is one of them. I've got a sneaking inclination that I have an aromatic ring. Let's see if that's supported within the HNMR. Okay, where does that show up? Six to eight, do I have a signal between six and eight? In fact, I actually have two signals within that. Okay. So both of those things to me would immediately scream, yay, I've got an aromatic structure. Okay. And I might immediately draw out an aromatic ring as part of my structure piece. Okay. That's getting a bit ahead of myself, but that is where I would kind of shift to. There's some other common peak patternings that I would then look through, but that comes from experience. If you don't have that experience, where do we start? That's right. We start with the chemical shift. When we look at the chemical shift, we have three signals. Three? Three signals. We get a shift at, uh, we'll call it red, 3.6. We got a green at 6.57. And we'll call it a blue at 7.05. What does it mean to have a signal at 3.6? I have a hydrogen bonded to, okay, question mark. What does it mean to have a signal at 6.5? That's probably bonded to a benzene. This is when I would get super excited and happy because if that's bonded to a benzene, that's a hell of a lot of atoms real quickly. Okay, so what I would start to do is now kind of push on that a little bit more. If I go through and look at the blue, the blue is giving me something similar I've got that signal within the aromatic, okay? And if you're going through and looking at those being, but, well, don't you have a whole bunch of other bonds on those carbons? Don't, aren't those hydrogens? I don't know if those are hydrogens. All I know is I have at least one. So instead of running this now, starting with red, green, blue, I'm probably gonna immediately skip red and start looking at only green and blue, okay? I'll now move to my next piece of in information, my integration. And my integration for green and blue was 2 and 2. What does that mean about my benzene structure? It's connected to 
you're running an interpretation, which is fine. If we run our interpretation, I would have to have a second hydrogen somewhere on that structure. This is kind of a new notation for us, so let's talk through it. What is the difference between the green hydrogen and the blue hydrogen in this drawing? Ignore the rest of all the other colors. This is just trying to differentiate them. Why is that notation weird? Let's try that. It's coming out from the middle. That doesn't make any sense. You can't bond to nothing. We're not bonding to nothing. The green bond is saying that hydrogen is very specifically bonded to that carbon. What is the blue bond saying? There is a hydrogen bonded somewhere on that ring. I don't know where it is yet, so I can't specify it because I don't know. But I know it's on there. That's what I'm trying to show in that small notation. Does that make sense? Right? Do you have a different idea how to represent it? By all means, go ahead and do that. What happens with the blue signal? Same thing. Right? I can, at this point, start to do some giddy dancing in my head, because I've done enough experience, to look at some possible probabilities and know what this pattern is, because I've seen it tons of times. Okay? But what we are saying is that there are a total of how many hydrogens on the ring? Four. Which means if I look at my structure, what I can do is instead of showing hydrogens, I can go through and put on some labels. I could say XY. That has four hydrogens. That has four hydrogens. That, whoa, has four hydrogens. There's only so many different ways now I can arrange substituents around that to get those potential structures. Okay? That is still three different options. How would I be able to differentiate those? Multiplicity. Okay? So I could immediately jump through and make those hoops because I've had the experience to recognize those patterns. Okay, what I'm trying to point out is that those patterns exist, and now we've got some kind of simpler interpretations that we could run. So we could move to our multiplicity. The multiplicity for green was what? Green was our 6.7. Okay. We're not looking at how do you count peaks? We interpreted the 2H, right? Integration of 2H. What is D? The dumb. We we're supposed to laugh at that. It wasn't very funny. It means doublet. How do you know it means doublet? Okay, so if we read the rest of the question, it tells us that. Or if we read the textbook where it talks about how we could represent the information, it would say doublet. What does doublet mean? Two peaks. What does it say for our blue signal? Same thing. Doublet. Two peaks. Which then means I can go into my neighbors. It says neighbors. Oh, sweet. Okay. One. Oops. One and one. If I went through to try and draw an interpretation of this, I've got my H. I know that second H is somewhere on here, but I don't want to worry about that second H right now. What I want to specify is how do I get one neighbor? Where would that neighbor have to be? Somewhere immediately next to it. What would have to be up here? Okay, that's what, kind of what I wanted to hear. Something that's not hydrogen. This is where I could drop an X. Okay? I have to have two hydrogens for this, an integration of two. Where's my second green hydrogen now have to be? It has to be immediately on the right side, so it's the exact same distance from whatever that X is. Okay? And because that's true, where's my black shadow hydrogen need to be? The exact same side on the other place. Which means what has to be at that last position? Something else that's not hydrogen. You notice I'm using X and Y. What if I'd use X here and X there? Would this have worked? Yeah. 
Hmm is a lovely sound. I like that. What do you mean, hmm? Keep going. You want it? Perfect symmetry, how many hydrogens would I have? I get one unique signal. All hydrogens would be the same, which means this has to be X and something other than X. This has to be X and Y. Hi. Okay. This is why I get giddy about seeing aromatics. I now have a massive structural piece. Okay. How massive really is this? Okay, those are green. I can now also specify that those must be the blue ones. Here's my X and then here's my Y. How many carbons have I identified? Six. How many hydrogens? Four. If we look at the formula, C6, damn, all my carbons are now nailed. Okay, I have two positions left. Chlorine can have how many bonds? One, which means... One of those is chlorine. That's now in lock. Which means what must the other one be? Nitrogen. It has to be nitrogen. But how many bonds can nitrogen have? Two. Three. Three. We've already got one to the ring. There were two hydrogens left over in my formula. Here's an answer. Did I even touch the red signal? No. The aromatic allowed me to jump through that with the molecular formula information. What happens if we push through the red signal? Hydrogen bonded to question. I don't know what it is. The integration was two, I hope. Yep, there it is. Two, okay, integration. Two hydrogens bonded to question mark. Are the, where am I? Oh, multiplicity. Multiplicity, singlet, which means how many neighbors does it have? Zero, why would it have zero neighbors? It's bonded to the nitrogen, which hides neighbors. Ta-da, there it all is. Wow, everything was internally congruent. That's amazing. We feeling better? Yeah. You should be really excited if you have an answer. <laughs> okay. When we talk about spectroscopy, almost all of it is what is the final answer. Okay. There's very few limited cases... Right? The spectroscopy packet that you're doing for lab and one of your short answers for the exam. I want to see all of the work. This doesn't cover all of the work because you haven't addressed what happened in red. That would need to get written down and now I could give you all the points for your full interpretation for everything. Right? But if you're in multiple choice, you don't need to show all of the work. Is it a good idea? Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty good idea, and you should probably start putting some of that down and get used to writing stuff in the multiple choice area. Remove some of that interpretation you're trying to do in your head. Make sense? Okay. I believe this question just wanted the structure, right? Yeah. Okay. So we've got that question nailed down. Because we're bringing up the exam, one of your colleagues had a very poignant question about it, what's on the exam. There are five short answer, and there are 39 multiple choice. Okay? If you're like, that's more multiple choice, Mike, that's rude. That's true, but remember, we're testing it a whole bunch of different varying pieces. So I could just show you an IR spectrum and say, what bond appears in this? You're like, oh, it's an OH. That was a two-second answer. I can ask a bunch of those to effectively inflate the questions of, on the exam, and allow you a broader span on what you're, you can or can't lose points on. Does that make sense? Okay. But that's how long the exam will be. Does that address all of the questions you asked? Okay. Uh, is there going to be a question where it's like asking a, a question about the molecular formula and then you have to ask the question? So is there a question asking about J, which is the coupling constant, okay, or talking about Hertz and running Hertz calculations? Um, the actual calculations, no understanding what it means, yes. 
So where is the meaning of that coupling constant in J appearing? Um, oh, you got one actually in here? So this one's taking it further than I want. So I wouldn't ask this on an exam because this is actually asking you to really heavily interpret this. Um, but it will provide me some context to be able to address how it's put out on the exam. So let's talk about this J in Hertz. Okay. That J is commonly referred to as coupling constant. What does coupling mean? It's where they put those cups on your back, they heat them up and it sucks all the blood up. That's cupping. There's no L. You laughed, thank you. Yeah, I did. Yeah, two things together. Where are we concerned about two things together? So bonds, but that's not really something we're addressing in any of our spectroscopy. Where are we concerned about how things could see each other? What's that? Numbers? Neighbors. neighbors. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's neighbors. When we're talking about coupling constant, it's the neighboring hydrogens. How are those neighboring hydrogens talking or communicating to each other? Okay. The more neighborly they are, the larger that coupling constant becomes. The less neighborly, the less likely they interact, and therefore the less it separates. Okay? This is why we have that three bond rule, because in the three bond rule, once you go beyond three bonds, they're now so far away that they can't really act as neighbors, which means the signal doesn't split. So when we're talking about coupling constant, it's purely based off of multiplicity and understanding something about neighbors. Right? Which should immediately set off alarm bells for you. Why? Was that an easy concept for you? Did you like neighbors and multiplicity and counting all those peaks? Okay. If your answer is no, then you should just accept it as a, a wash and you're just going to ignore those questions when they appear. Okay. Otherwise, if you're like, yeah, I think I've got it, now you can actually start pushing into this. This is something that's addressed within the question or within um, this question, which is why it's there. It's content that should be discussed, you should be exposed to, you're probably not going to remotely master it. And if you guys want to have a conversation, that's okay, but I'd recommend you take it outside. Do we need to worry about coupling here? When are we concerned about coupling? neighboring hydrogens. So if I'm asking, am I concerned about it? I'm looking at these hydrogens, and those hydrogens must be considered neighbors. If they are neighbors, what must they also be? I think I heard it. Different. Different. Okay, the word we've been using is chemis chemically distinct. Okay, are those hydrogens chemically distinct? No. Okay, because they're not chemically distinct, they aren't considered neighbors, and the whole thing falls apart. We don't got to worry about that one. How about the next one? Yes. Okay. Yes, these are now chemically distinct. Okay. Because they are chemically distinct, they do see each other as neighbors, okay. which means their signal will split. Okay. So yes, we need to be worried about it. We should be thinking about a J value. How about the next one? Nope, again, not chemically distinct, so we'll ignore that one. How about the next one? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we do need to be concerned about this J value again. What are we concerned about in the J value? The J value has to do with how they are neighbors. Okay. And when we're looking at comparing those two structures, what's the difference between them? That's a hard question. See what you can come up with. Okay, it wasn't that hard. Fine. We're really looking at cis and trans between these. Okay? I would argue it's, it's not really cis and trans, because what cis and trans is referring to is the bromine and chlorine, and I actually don't care about them. I care about the hydrogens. Okay? 
And what I care about is how they neighbor each other. Is the distance between the red hydrogen and the blue hydrogen different for these two compounds? Maybe we'll look, well, it's the same number of bonds. I didn't ask about the number of bonds. I said their relative distance from each other. These hydrogens are on the same side versus on the opposite side. There is a change in that distance. Because there's a change in that distance, what does that mean about the neighborly feeling? It's different. That neighborly feeling being different would suggest that if I am able to figure out what this J value is, I can distinguish the two spectra, because they have the same number of hydrogens, so the same number of signals, they have the same relative location to all those things, so we're getting the same chemical shift, same integration, but I'd be able to distinguish one spectra from the other based off of how neighborly the signals appeared, meaning when I look at the split of them, how far do they split? So for this first one, and full disclosure, totally guessing on the exact details here. I have not memorized it. But we're about to draw some stuff where we're going to look at some, some numbers, and I'm, I'm guessing. Okay, for that first one, how many neighbors does the red hydrogen have? One. There's only one other hydrogen. We said they were distinct. So how many peaks? Two, two peaks, right? So I get two peaks. Color coding it that way was a bad idea, but it'll work. How about for the other one? The exact same thing. Mike, how is this different? You tell me, how is it different? The distance between the peaks is different. Right? So if we bust out a ruler, we could measure the distance in between and say they were, dis they were different. Okay? That measurement is the part that I don't know the exacts on. This is where you would have to look it up. Okay? And what we found is that if you have structures that are coupled as cis versus trans, the distance between the peaks in that coupling are different and significantly different enough that we can take measurements to see that difference. Okay? The argument I'm making here is that cis is closer and therefore we get a larger spread. Okay? So we could go through and say, well, at this distance, really making up numbers now, is 12. 12 what? What was the other half of your question? Hurts. Hurts. Okay, because it hurts to make up numbers. Ah, uh, yeah. And the trans is 9 hertz. Like, really? I can tell a difference? Like, that's, that's all I need. Yeah, for its cis, it's like 10 to 13 hertz is the difference. Whereas for trans, it's 7 to 10. So you would just have to know those values. Do I want you to memorize those? Hell, please, no, do not. Okay? What I want you to be able to do is look at a table of coupling constants and be like, this is the relationships between them. Kind of, sort of? Okay. Where we're going to encounter this Hertz thing appear again is because you'll be like, well, it's just cis and trans. Take a look at F. Is F cis and trans? No. So do I need to worry about this J value thing? Why do I worry about the J value thing? It wasn't because of cis and trans. What was it because of? They were distinct hydrogens. Are those hydrogens distinct? This hydrogen looks across and sees chlorine. This hydrogen looks across and sees bromine. Those would not be chemically distinct if the bond in between could rotate. Can that bond rotate? No, which means they're distinct. And if they're distinct, now I've got to worry about coupling constants. Yay. Okay. Again, spitball guessing. I'm going to say the coupling constant is even greater. Why would I guess greater? They're even closer to each other than cis or trans. Okay? So maybe if we look at this signal, it's going to be boom, where that distance is 15 hertz, not drawn to scale. 
right? Kind of, sort of. And I said that this was going to move into this territory of how it's going to be important for the exam, and I kind of goofed. Yeah, I've already crossed the bridge. Got to go all the way. It was wrong, of course. That's how it works. Okay. Where I thought this was going to go, and it horrendously did not, but we can kind of pull it out, is what happens in this particular case. Okay. All three of those hydrogens are chemically distinct from each other. So if I look at the HNMR for this, I should see three signals. Everybody okay with that? Okay. What should they integrate to? One each, because there's only one hydrogen representing them, right? So each one's one. And now the hard question, what do they split into? How many neighbors does the green hydrogen have? Two. So if it has two neighbors, what would we expect? Three peaks. How many neighbors? The red one? Two. Two neighbors, so three. we expect them all to have three peaks. Why is this a big deal? Are the green and blue hydrogen different enough? This enough is a nasty question. Yeah. Okay. Different enough becomes a nasty question because it comes down to what our instrument can detect. So if we just go through bare minimum of what our instrument sees, it sees the red hydrogen. Because it sees the red hydrogen, what does it produce? Real simple. Yeah. A peak. Okay. If our instrument is good enough and strong enough and powerful enough, what it can start to do is now say, does that red hydrogen see neighbors? Because if it sees neighbors, it can start to split the signal. And this is where things get wonky on us. The blue and the green hydrogen are different neighbors. If you think about your neighbors, you've got people, let's say you're, not, you're in the middle, there's two houses on either side of you. Do you have the exact same relationship with both neighbors? No, if, if a fire broke out, I'm running to one of my neighbors, going to wake them up first, saying, hey, the house is on fire, we need, to, we need to evacuate, then I will go to the other neighbor. Why? Because I like them better. That's not quite, that's, just stop digging. Okay. Same thing is going to happen here. So that red hydrogen sees the blue hydrogen, goes, ooh, you're a closer neighbor to me. Because I see you as a neighbor, what happens to the signal? It splits. What does it split into? How many blue hydrogens are there? One. So what does it split into? Two peaks. Nothing different. It's just two peaks. It just splits into two peaks. Okay? Because neighbors plus one equals your number of peaks. But now a house is burning down. I've got to warn the other neighbor. I mean, I don't hate them. I just don't like them as much. Okay. Now I see the other one, one neighbor. Now that I see the other neighbor, what happens to my signal? It splits again into how many peaks? Two peaks. How many peaks do I have? Two peaks, which means what happens? That signal splits. That signal splits. Oh, that looks awful. Yeah, this is what's known as complex splitting. There's an interesting tie-in back to the question that Ivan asked about with our coupling constants. Look at the distance between our blue signals. That's the same as the center-to-center -center distance over here. There's a coupling constant related right there. That coupling constant is between the red and the blue. This is the red-to-blue neighbor. There's also a coupling constant in here. That coupling constant is the same as the coupling constant over there, and that's the red to green. So if I see this and I'm really picky and nasty with looking at all those peaks, I can go through and I can calculate those coupling constants to be able to say exactly where all of those things are. Is that something you could do? Yes. Is that something you're expected to do? No. 
What you're expected to do is to recognize, oh crap, this is complex splitting. It's gonna do something goofy. I need to realize what that something goofy looks like. Kinda sorta? How do we describe this? Is this a true doublet? A doublet is two peaks of equal intensity. Is this two peaks of equal intensity? So we look within that box, how many green lines do I see? Four peaks. So is it a quartet? Is it four peaks? Well, what's the splitting pattern for four peaks? Does it match that? No, so it can't be a quartet. It's not a doublet. What the hell is it? You might have just mouthed it. It's a doublet of doublets. That's bullshit. You can't make that up. Yep, that's how it works. Okay. Could you have a doublet of triplets? Yes. Can you have a triplet of triplets? Yes. Could you have a doublet of triplets of triplets? Yes. Okay. So this can continue to go further and further out. All of it relies on your magnet being big enough and strong enough to differentiate those signals. So while it is something that can be potentially seen, most magnets that we encounter aren't strong enough to resolve that internal difference. And what ends up happening is that secondary split starts overlapping and it looks like a normal triplet. It can't split these two far enough away from each other. And so what happens is that we would see the green signal Green signal, darker green signal, green signal. But it doesn't get darker, what does it get? Taller, which means it starts to look like a triplet, which would make sense if we had two neighbors, which is exactly what it looks like. Yay. I talk too much, I'm done.